Oh, 
to be God's people, even though we have not yet congregated in God's place. But we are the church, though we're not at the church. And we are still here on this morning to learn of God's promises so that one day we can live in perpetuity with him forevermore by and by. We're thankful for all of those who have served in the worship service in this physical place. And we're thankful also for all of you who gathered there in cyberspace. It's interesting that when you attempt to preach about Satan, as we'll do today, and delay his work, that he will then try to delay your worship. But the blessing is we are still here for no other reason than to worship God according to spirit and in truth. And the coronavirus has taught us nothing. It is that worshiping God in spirit and in truth does not necessitate worshiping God within brick and mortar. On this day, we begin our series on fighting temptations. Fighting temptations. And there's no better place to start than by looking at the book of James, specifically James chapter 1, tabernacling at the 13th verse. I hope you give me some time on this morning because I have to link some things together in order for verses 13 to 18 to make sense. But in James chapter 1, verse number 13, the Bible begins by saying, When tempted, no one should say that God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and or lust and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters, for every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might become a kind of first fruits of all that he created. If you have some time, child of God, on this morning, I want to speak from the thought, from the root to the fruit. From the root to the fruit. Let us go to God in prayer. Devil and kind and gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what was, what is, and what will be as long as we continue to stay faithful. Father, this time, Father, clear out everything within your manservant's mind and help him to focus on the task at hand. Father, be with everyone under the sound of my voice, Father. Open their minds, their hearts, their spirits, their souls, and yes, even their ears to hear a word coming straight from you via your manservant. Your manservant personally is a sinner. So I ask that you forgive me of my own personal sins. And now upon my repentant heart, speak to me and speak through me. Father, bring us as empty cups before a flowing fountain. Fill us, Jesus. Fill us even when we do not want any more. Father, bless the word. Father, bless your servant. Father, bless us all as your children. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. From the root to the fruit. As we search to identify the root of sinful temptation, I first want to encourage you and introduce you to the root of the New Testament scriptural text. For while the book of James is a latter book in biblical construction, it may in fact be the earliest book in New Testament communication. We have proof of this reality in that James speaks of the Jews in absence of the Gentiles. The Jews have in fact been scattered and the Gentiles have not yet been secured. So here we have a text that is familiar with Christ's ascension, but not yet Gentilian inclusion. James here is the half-brother of Jesus the Christ. For with Jesus he shares the same mother, but through this text he invites us all to share the same father. The biblical canon rhetorically reflects 
that James, as Jesus' brother, was first agnostic to later then become an adherent of his biological brother's ministry. Not only being led to become a believer in Christ at his ascension, but then later to become a leader of the church of Jerusalem by position. It is here from the city of Jerusalem that James writes to the Jews who have been scattered outside of Palestine. And his core message to them is to be spiritual even where you are in fact stationed. Making sure that your faith, your belief, and your Christian exaltation and exhibition are not just on a proverbial Sunday, but as a matter of fact, making sure that you are a Christian every day. That's why James, throughout his entire book, James first talks about dealing with testing, trial, and temptation daily. And James 2, James talks about dealing with partiality and preferential treatment daily. And James 3, James talks about watching your mouth daily. And James 4, James talks about drawing near to God daily, humbling ourselves unto God daily. And James 5, he talks about praying for each other, for the prayers of the righteous availed much how often daily. James is not being on orthopraxy as much as he is on practicality. James implores us to make sure that your Sunday theology and ecclesiology match our daily actuality. James declares, you have obeyed my brother Jesus, but now will you live for our Father God. James has only five chapters to impress upon these Jews this faith and its most quintessential truths. Therefore, here the Journal of James has little academic astuteness and theoretical charm. He doesn't discourse in dialogue, but rather he ministers by monologue. James brings home the topic of faith. As he brings it forth at least 12 times in his writing. He reminds us that faith must be visible, faith must work, faith must produce, and that faith is more than verbiage, but it must in fact become a verb. In verb form, faith obeys, faith endures, faith controls, faith waits, faith displays, faith draws, and faith demonstrates. But in all things, the faith that James conveys and communicates it's not just a saving faith, but rather it's a lifestyle of faith. So in endeavoring to further our faith, here James demarcates, delineates, and differentiates both testing and tempting. Because there is a difference between testing and tempting. And how God tests us to improve us, but Satan tempts us to embarrass us. But James then threads both of these juxtapositions together with the supplication of wisdom. For James says that God gives us wisdom through the realities of test, trial, and temptation. And unfortunately, wisdom must be both earned and learned by experience. Meaning what? There is no book that gives wisdom, but rather it's our submission to the book that makes us wise. Yeah. So here, James speaks to these Jews and even to our Jews so that we may be wise and then stop living life by surprise. James chapter 1 verse number 5 the Bible says if you lack wisdom the Greek here is first class conditional it's not if you lack wisdom but rather since you lack wisdom meaning what the text of James 1 is written to us and them because in fact we lack wisdom so since this morning we lack wisdom now let us sit and witness to James's teaching about the root and fruit of testing and temptation now, in reading the book of James, particularly James chapter 1, let us realize that James here utilizes a Jewish rhetorical device known as pearls on a string. Meaning that James, just like the wisdom book of Proverbs, jumps from topic to topic in succession and sequence. But the common theme of James chapter 1 is the topic of wisdom. Wisdom in patience. Wisdom and endurance. Wisdom 
in trials, wisdom in tribulation, and yes, even wisdom in temptation. Now, James chapter 1, I know you want me to get to verse number 13. If you'll pray with me for a little while, I want to go back to verse number 1. So in James chapter 1, verse number 1, the Bible there says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus the Christ. It is interesting that James begins by calling himself a servant versus calling himself a sibling of Jesus. The fact that James says, I'm a servant, instead of taking the rightful place as a sibling, is indicative of the humility that he will tell us about in James chapter number 4. James is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who are you writing to, James? To the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, to the twelve tribal divisions that ceased to function as geopolitical units back in 722 BC. Meaning what? James uses this designation to refer to Jews that are likely scattered outside and aside from Israel. This communication of canon was designed to have a Jewish audience presently, but a Gentilian effect futuristically with the intimation and introduction of brothers and sisters in the text. Meaning what? Though I'm talking to Jews in 40 AD, I'm speaking to everyone eternally. This is also important because somebody needs to know, especially our brethren of the Hebrew Israelite community, that this promise of all men being saved, even outside of the Jewish race, was given long before Cornelius' house, but rather it was given to Abraham back in the book of Genesis. Now, verse number two. The verse number two is a popular text. It says, Count it all joy. Who? My brothers and sisters, whenever you face and encounter trials of many kinds, count it all joy. Consider it all joy. The Greek construction here means consider it all joy. How often? Now and forever. Consider what joy? Consider it all joy. Greek construction, everything individually and collectively, we must find joy from it. There is nothing that befalls us that should not be seen as beneficial for us and thus gives us joy. Meaning what? As Christians who strive to be mature, our pain should give us joy and our pain should give us joy. Our job should give us joy and our lack of a job should give us joy. Our poverty should give us joy and our prosperity should give us joy. And not just any joy, but rather pure joy. Nothing but joy. Supreme Joy, joy here, speaks of cheerfulness, gladness, and gratefulness. James refers to an extended state of well-being rather than an immediate feeling of happiness. Meaning this is not speaking about joy for the moment, but rather joy for maturity and eternity. Furthermore, just because whatever you're going through is not good for your present. These trials are still good for our potential. Who are you talking to? My brothers and my sisters. The entirety of the church. What are you trying to tell us, James? Whenever you face and encounter trials of many kinds. Whenever you face. Not if you face, but whenever you face. Meaning you will face them now and again and time and again. And not just whenever you face trials, but also whatever trials you face. I wish I had a church in cyberspace. What are you trying to say, Jared? Meaning that the joy and trials and tests is not a joy of happiness, but rather it's a joy of holiness. Therefore, there can be joy even in substance abuse. Because through that which is horrible, God can still bring you to a place of holiness. And when I see my hangouts then working for my holiness, then and only then can I find joy in every situation. I can then find joy in my sin and joy in my success. I can find joy in my stress. I can find joy when I'm depressed. I can find joy when I'm tested and tried and even sick and tired for the joy that God wants to be exhibited and expressed from me is not seen on my face, but rather it's seen in my faith. When you face or encounter trials, when you fall into trials, 
Trials here is opposed to temptation. Understand, because trials are designed to test man's fidelity, integrity, virtue, consistency, and spirituality. Unfortunately, here's grammatically the negative variant of trials. Meaning what? The trials that are meant to test your fidelity and integrity and spirituality are even designed to bring you. But if we have faith, then God can use that which was meant to bring us to then bless us and quite frankly bind us to him and bind us to each other. Furthermore, the Greek term here refers to unexpected and unwelcome trials. The Christian's trials are many, and most certainly they are unscheduled. We don't like this introductory ideology because that means that when it comes to some things that we can't pray it away. I wish I had a church in cyberspace. We don't like this teaching because that means when it comes to some things, we in fact can't pray it away. Because God has forecasted and foreordained it to stay in our life because he's testing us with it. Jesus Christ, as our example, Hebrews 5 and 8, he was perfected by the things he has suffered. Saints, sometimes you got to suffer. Meaning what? Some things have to strike us in order to strengthen us. You're going to have tried. They're going to be unexpected. They're going to be unwelcome. And the Bible says they're going to come of many kinds. Many kinds speaks of many colors, many flavors. It'll be very gay. It'll be a diverse night. An appropriate uh, 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 semblance here would speak of how light travels through a prison. And when light travels through a prison, it then on the other side creates a rainbow of many colors going in many different directions. The trials of life sometimes seem like that. They come at us many times from many places and from many directions. But yet the source is the same and the outcome is the same. When it comes to being tested, understand the source of testing is the same. It comes from God. And the outcome is the same because the outcome of testing is our strength and our maturity. Now, just because it comes from God and it is for, in fact, our growth, it may still come in many colors, many shades, and many manifestations. My trial may be my health. Your trial may be your wealth. But all trials are for our healing and our maturity. That's just verses one and two. Verse number three, because you know that what the testing of your faith before trials was in a negative grammatical iteration. Testing is in a positive grammatical iteration. Testing is a good thing. Testing here means to put one in the fire to burn off the dross. Meaning what? God wants to put all of us in the fire so that the best of us, which will reflect him, will in fact remain. If I had time, child of God, I would tell you that God has put you in some stations and some situations because he had some things he had to burn off of you. There were some things that were of you that are not of God. Therefore, God sent you through a test. God sent you through a trial. Why? Because he's trying to perfect us as pure gold. That's why on the other side, we can say, thank God that God took me through it. Because when God took me through it, he took some things off of me and took some things away from me. Ooh, and child of God, you'll be surprised how you're living once you get rid of some of the things that make you die. Understand. Of your faith. It produces, it performs, it achieves, it accomplishes, it works out perseverance. Meaning sometimes through the fire, God has to send us in order to shape us. And he has to shape us in order to save us. It produces perseverance. It produces endurance, patience, and long suffering. If I had time, I would tell you very quickly that sometimes the testing of God comes in stair-step fashion. Meaning what? Sometimes God only allows us to face what we are first prepared to face. 
because we have been previously picked. Meaning what? It's in stair step. God only takes us to level number three, when in fact we've been to level number two. I'm so glad that God does not kill me from taking me from level one to level five, but rather he gives me different trials and different tests that build me up, in fact, for the next test. What are you trying to say, Jeremy? I'm trying to say that God doesn't bring you to what, in fact, you cannot run through. Furthermore, whatever you're going through, you have been, in fact, trained for it before you're tested by it. First of all, let perseverance or endurance have its finished work so you may be mature and complete. Again, demarcating and differentiating testing and tempting. When we are being tested, we are told to endure. When we're being tempted, we are told to evacuate. When God is pruning us, we got to hunker down. When the devil is pricking us, we must roll out. Why? Because testing must happen. So that we must be mature and complete. Now, let's transition with the text. Verse number 12. Verse number 12 links with verses 1 and 4. It's still talking about trials. Verse number 12 says, Blessed is the one who perseveres on the trial. Fortunate is the one. The one who has been under trial has then learned a different mindset, a different orientation, and a different disposition as to when they are no longer affected by eternal circumstances. Oh, if I had time to tell you, have you ever been tested and been through a trial and then once you come out the other side, things don't matter that much anymore. The stuff that used to make you mad don't matter anymore. The stuff that used to frustrate you don't make you mad anymore. You were sick and went to the hospital you had a 50-50 chance to live. God brought you out. God brought you through. That helps him. And now that you've been, you face death face to face. They can't nobody get in your face because things don't matter to you anymore. Sometimes uh, when you've been through a trial, once you lost a job, you're not, you're not afraid to lose another job because you've been jobless before. Once you lost a man or a woman, you're not afraid to bake up with another man or a woman because you've been broken up before. What are you trying to say? Sometimes trials are beneficial because they put us in a blessed state where external stuff don't matter anymore. Blessed is the one who perseveres in the trial. Because having stood the test, he will be approved. Approved speaks of gold and silver. The thought is that one must be afflicted in order to be approved. And if we're ever going to be proved, we're going to have to be approved. It brings the word picture of steel and how steel is formed. Steel, when it's hot and in its state of liquidity, when it's poured into a light oil, the shock of the oil, and as a matter of fact, the shock of the temperature going from hot to cold so fast makes it seven times harder than regular steel. That's why it's called tempered steel. Can I tell you something very quickly? God wants us to be tempered as well. He wants us to be proved so we can be approved. Therefore, he will put us in situations, even though they are intense. Every now and then, he'll put us in intense temperature so that we can be tempered believers and not just temporary believers. That person receives a crown of life that's rigor and reward from the Lord who promised and the Lord who loves him. Verse number 13. When tempted, now we shift from testing to temptation. When tempted, no one should say that God is tempting me. Can I tell you something? Everybody under the sound of my voice has been tempted before. If we're not tempted right now, temptation, different than testing, temptation is an attempt to try or test one's faith, one's virtue, one's character by the enticement of sin. Child of God, if you want to know how connected you are to God, see what happens when you're outside the church building. See, God demands faith, but God also allows character to be tempted, rather tested, and Satan loves tempting us to see if we're at outside of our character. To be tempted is an attempt, is an attempt, is an attempt to try or test one's faith, 
one's virtue and one's character by enticement of sin. Notice, I kept saying attempt for a reason. In all things, we give Satan way too much credit. Satan just attempts, for Satan is not omniscient, he's just observant. Let me say it again. In all things, we give Satan too much credit. Satan just attempts, for Satan is not omniscient, he's just observant. Satan is not able to read our minds. Satan is not able to read our hearts. He is just able to read our habits. So what he does in temptation is he makes attempts until he finds a viable attack. And if not abated, then he will continuously attack until he annihilates you. Grandma would say that Satan can't read your thoughts, but he sure can't read your lips. Meaning we ought to be careful what we say. You ever said something crazy? Like today can't get no worse. And the devil said, really? Let's see what I can try and do. So be careful what you say. And by extension, be careful what you see and be careful what you hear. We'll talk about that later on. You got to be careful what you say. Be careful what you see. Be careful what you hear. Because since Satan doesn't know you, he then sits with you in order to learn about you. And once he envisions your weakness, then he will expose you to wickedness. I wish I had a church in cyberspace. In James chapter 1, again, temptation is broadly defined as the enticement to do evil. Satan is the tempter. Satan's been tempting since the beginning of time. Satan tempted Eve. Satan tempted Adam. Satan tempted Cain. Satan tempted Abraham. Satan tempted David. Satan tempts us. All of them, all of us are faced with a challenge, but each of us has a choice. We give Satan too much credit for the things that we really want to do anyway. Notice the text doesn't say if you're tempted, but when you're tempted. Tempting is going to happen. With trials that come in many colors, but temptation also comes in many colors, but temptation more specifically comes in the color that you like. It comes in the flavor that you like. Satan studies us to see what will sink us. When can No one should say. Present active imperative, meaning what? Stop saying. That's for the Jews in us today. Stop saying that God has tempted me. God here in the Greek is theos. It's the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I alliterate it in Old Testament. It'll be Elohim. God does not tempt. Not only does God singularly not tempt, but God in all his manifestations does not tempt. There is no part of God's trichotomy. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit that wants to tempt and draw you away from his body. To do so would make God antithetical of himself. And scripture already tells us that a house divided against itself shall not stand. Therefore, only one who is against me, Satan, will draw you away from me. But as this text teaches, the one who is against God, Satan, draws me away from God. But then the only me that me can blame is in fact me. For Satan casts the loop, but I'm the fish that takes the bait. Don't say that God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil. God is not liable to sin and temptation. Anything that comes to you from him must flow through him. And since evil can flow through him, then evil can come to you by him. The difference between testing and tempting is not necessarily the occasion, but rather it's the desired outcome. Trouble can come by way of testing and tempting. But with God, the desired outcome of testing is faith. With Satan, the desired outcome of temptation is failure. When God tested Job, the desired outcome which was realized was faithfulness. Because though Satan was involved, Satan could not do anything that God did not allow. Our 
alternative. When Satan came to tempt Jesus, and when he comes to tempt us, the occasion is still trouble. We'll talk about that in two weeks. But the desired outcome is failure. Verse number 14. Here, we have a shift of responsibility. It's not God's fault. It's not Satan's fault. But it is our fault. Verse number 14. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire. And they are enticed. Whose fault? Each person's fault. It's interesting how in verse number 14, does each person, James relinquishes the fault from God and the fault from Satan and puts the fault for temptation on us. For even while Satan presents the opportunity, he is not the one who creates a desire. Satan provides the meal, but not the appetite. Therefore, we must understand that we are responsible for our own appetite, our desire, as it pertains to improper, inappropriate, unspiritual, unspiritual things. Each one of us is tempted when we are dragged away. Tempted here speaks of the trapping of animals. Understand, temptation usually wants to achieve a good thing just in a bad way. Temptation wants to achieve a good thing outside of the will of God. It's not right to want to pass a test, but we can't cheat on that test. It's not wrong to want to eat, but it's wrong to eat toward gluttony. Temptation, a lot of times, is to accomplish a good thing in a bad way. But the trap is set when man is tempted. It's the trapping of an animal or the luring of a fish to a hook. Each man is tempted. It's not the action of temptation, but rather it's the reaction of us who are tempted. It's not the fault of the external thing. It's the fault of the internal reality. It's nobody's fault that beer smells like beer. It's nobody's fault that weed smells like weed. I wish I had a church in cyberspace. It's nobody's fault that, that sexual morality is sexual morality. It's nobody's fault that somebody might be dressed scantily clad. It's nobody's fault that donuts taste good to the glutton. It's nobody's fault of external. Stop blaming the external and blame the internal. Sin is a problem of the heart. And too often we blame the hands when the hands only operate in conjunction and with instruction from the heart. Stop slapping the hand when you do wrong and attempt to sanctify the heart when we do wrong. Understand, to be dragged away speaks of a trap that's been set for an animal. Or more perfectly, it speaks of a fishing line that has been dropped into a body of water. The line has been set. The hook is sharp, but we can't see the hook because of the bait. And any fisherman knows your best chance of catching good fish and much fish is in the quality of your bait. Understand, Satan may bait the hook, but we're the ones who draw away. It's not anybody's fault that the line is in the water. The problem is that the fish wants what's on the line. Therefore, the fish must condition itself to say, no matter what's on the hook, I don't want it. Because it's not what God has for me. Because verse number 17, any good and perfect gift comes from above. From the Father himself. I know that whatever I'm doing, if it takes me away from the path of God and the word of God and the way of God and the will of God, that is temptation and is being drawn away. God has been going this way, but there's always something over there that looks good, but it's not good for me. Who, if I had time, I would tell somebody everything that really ain't no. We're dragged away. Some of us right now can't operate in our purpose because there's something tempting us. We cannot bring our potential and our power because there's something else that unfortunately looks more attractive than what God has for us. The problem is we would rather go for what's temporary than go for what's eternal. It's interesting. When we're drawn away, the hunter and the fisherman have to bait the trap and bait the hook because no animal, no Christian, no fish is going to purposely go for the trap knowing that they will be trapped. Nobody's going to go for the hook if there's no bait on it. The problem is we never see the hook. 
Can I be real with y'all? Can I be real with cyberspace? Uh, if you're visiting, I'm sorry, but this is how we real at the Gray Road Church. I, I want to be real with my folk for a minute. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, we only do see it when we think we ain't going to get caught. If somebody told you that this time would be that time, you wouldn't do it. If you can see the hope and not the pain, then you wouldn't go for it. We only step in the stuff that we think we can step out of. We never see the hope. We're drawn away by what? Our own lust or desire. Lust is the proper word here. Uh, we, we have a problem with lust in our ideology and iteration because we think that lust only means sex. You can lust a whole lot of things outside of sex. You can lust food. You can lust power. Okay? Uh, but it's, it's your lust. It's your desire. See, we think of sin as a single act. God perpetuates it here as a process. Adam committed one sin, but it's the process of what we live today. See, that's how Satan gets us. Number one, he tricks us, then he traps us, he makes the trap look good, he makes us think that we're going to survive the trap, and after all of that, then he says, okay, uh, uh, whatever you think is going to happen, it's going to happen right now. It's a process, and what we do is we, we start the process hoping we can jump out the process, and that's not how it works. Sin will suck you in, and then it will do you in. Understand? Sin begins in the mind. That's why even scripture says, out of the heart, the mouth is speaking. So man is drawn away and he's enticed. The trap is set. Man leaves the proper way. Man leaves the proper will. Goes after his own will. He's drawn away. And what happens? He's enticed. The trap closes. He bites the bait. He takes the hook. And just like the fish, just like the so is the same. When we get caught, we automatically say, hold on, wait a minute, how did this happen? We know how it happened. We made a choice. We had a challenge. We made a choice. You're caught by the trap. Child of God, be reassured that when we talk about this, this drawing away, it speaks of being drawn away from a place of safety. Meaning what? God's word is safety. God's will is safety. God's way is safety. I'm so glad that in God I can hide in the cleft of the rock, but sometimes in our own ignorance, in our own arrogance, in our own insolence, we leave what's good to gain something that in fact will kill us. How many of us have left God, which is greater, for temptation, which is lesser? We leave safety. We leave surety. And then we get caught. Am I talking to anybody who's ever been caught? Don't be fooled. Because with sin, if you keep nibbling at the bait, you'll be caught and trapped will be your feet. Sin is never easy to handle. Sin is never safe to handle. Can I be real with somebody real quick? Sin is never safe to handle. You can never handle fire and not get burned. Sin will eventually do a sin. Sin never keeps a secret. Sin never plays by the rules. Am I the only one who's ever tried to get sin to play by the rules? I'll say, well, this particular sin, I'm only going to do it this way, at this time, in this place. And when I try to set rules for sin, sin then laughs when I try to legislate it. Sin does what? It lulls us into a relationship of wretchedness that fills us with emptiness. There is no such thing as sin with no strings attached. Sin always has strings attached. Understand. I love how in this text and in our lives, there's time that transpires between thought and trap. But in real time, sometimes it's mere seconds. Ever been there as soon as you thought it, you went ahead and did it? And you did it so fast, you said, how did I get here? But God does put time in between thought and trap. We have a challenge, but we also have a choice. Let me do verse number 15 and I'll quit. I didn't have too much fun today. In verse number 15, the Bible says, Then after desire, the root has conceived. Then it does what? It gives birth to sin. Understand that there's a conception. 
and conception in practicality and spirituality needs at least two different partners and or variables. Meaning what? Our desire must link with something in order to make sin. What does it link with? It links with opportunity. See, what Satan does is he sits with us since he can't read our minds and our thoughts. He then peeks out our desire and he then creates an opportunity to match our desire. He sits with us alone enough. He sees what we hear. He sees how we think. He sees what we say. And he says, all right, that's what he likes. That what, that's what she likes. I will create an opportunity to match her desire. And when desire then gets with opportunity, it conceives sin. Hamashi is the term that conceives and missing out the mark. But sin, when it's full grown, does what? It gives birth to death. Hold on, wait a minute. Desire had to conceive with opportunity, but sin conceived with nothing to bring death. Which means what? When desire got with opportunity, it made sin. Sin would then have to be in the female form because that means that sin, when it's born, is already born within it, death. Which means what? Sin does not have to be with anything to make death. But rather fact, when desire gets with opportunity and makes sin, it's only a matter of time that sin brings death because sin needs nothing else for death to occur but time. Yeah. Meaning what? When sin has been born of our desire and our opportunity, then sin walks around sin is desire. The fruit of sin is death. Sin will kill us. Verse number 18 at your own personal time. Since there's a birth that brings about death. Since there's a birth that brings about sin. God says I want you to live differently than that. My will for you is not death but rather birth. That's why I birthed you again. How's your purpose? Verse 18. Through the way. Through the gospel message. I birthed you so you can be a kind of first fruits. I have another birth for you. But if you don't take the birth of the gospel, you will deal with the birth of sin, which will bring forth the birth of death. Death is eternal separation. I don't want you to be separated from me. Thereby, be born from the truth, be born from the word, and the word that saves you must then shape you. Why? Because it talks about the word for the rest of James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse number 18, verse 21, verse 23, verse 25, all talks about the word. It talks about we must accept the word. Verse 21, we must do what the word says. Verse number 22, we must form the imagery of a mirror with the word. Verse number 23, we must glance at the word, I'd rather glare at the word and not glance at the word. Verse number 26, the word must then cause us to be spiritual and not just religious. Why? Because you need to be born from the word. So you'll stop birthing sin. Which will eventually burn death. Temptation is different than testing. Testing is to mature you. Tempting is to embarrass you. Do not be tempted. We all have a challenge, but more importantly, we have a choice. If perchance you are a child of God and you sin, you need to pray on this morning. Though we are apart physically, we are together virtually. If you want the prayers of the church, the prayers of the leadership, feel free to email us at thegrayevents at gmail.com. We do care about you, and we care about praying for you. Because as James already reports, the prayers of the righteous thus in fact avail of much. If you're not a child of God, become one before it's everlastingly too late. There's no better time to become a child of God than right now, even though we are in quarantine. The baptismal pool is still open. The baptismal pool still has water. Even this time, do not be fooled and thinking that social distancing gives you an excuse for spiritual intimacy. God still wants to be one with you. And there's only one way he can be one with you, and that's by the blood of Christ, which resides in the water, which must be fully immersed into. The pool is still here. Yeah. At 48, 26, it's still open. We encourage you, if you want to be baptized, to call the church, 513-541-4100. We encourage you to email us at thegrandvents at gmail.com. We encourage you to get in our DMs on Facebook. We encourage you to post on our wall. Life is too short, eternity is too long, and hell is too hard for you to know what to do and not do what must be done. You must first hear the word of God. You've heard me, I'm not enough. 
You must believe that he is, and that he's a reward of those who diligently seek him. You must repent of your sins. You must confess that he is. You must be baptized in order to be saved. But there's no way around that child of God. You must be born again through the word. Birth demands enclosure in water. Birth demands the breaking of water. Birth demands a new identity. Will you be born of the word? Because oh, how sad to allow sin to exist and sin to continue. Because when sin births, it's dead. Therefore, come to life while there's still time. If you're not a child of God, email us, DM us, put it on Facebook in the text uh, below, but do something right now for your soul's salvation. If you are a child of God, you need prayer. We still want to connect with you. Do what you need to do right now while there's still time to do it. Do it right now as we sing the song of invitation. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. You know that I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. You know that he gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by.
And let us pray for them. Father God, we thank you for uh, thank you for you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love that you give us. We thank you for all the things that you've done for us, Father. We thank you for this opportunity to come and be able to spread your word virtually to uh, whoever is watching at this time, Father. We thank you for the homes, our, our families. There's so many things that we are grateful for that we just take the time and just look around us. He's blessed us with so much. Thank you for your son. In his name we pray. Also, we have the opportunity to commune one with another. I would read upon, uh, upon you here, uh, would be Luke chapter 22, uh, verses 14 and following. And it reads, when the hour had come, he reclined at the table, and the apostles were with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is, is the new covenant in my blood. Many of you have the communion of God at this time. Let us partake in the communion. Father, we thank you for this cup. We thank you for this blood, which represents uh, your body, or your, your, your blood. And we thank you for the bread that represents your body. And we take this in the matter that's pleasing your sight. In his name we pray. And that concludes the Lord's Supper. I am so glad you died for me.
of the stay-at-home order will be stuck like this for the next four Sundays, at least. And I say stuck like this because as I said yesterday to the Great Road Church, we miss you. Each and every one of us, we miss you. I I'll be transparent. I told Tamika when I did the first draft of recording that I started to cry a little bit. And I started to cry because I miss each and every one of you. And I hope that you miss us here at the Great too. But we're so glad and we're so blessed and we have this avenue of virtual worship. We're so blessed that we had all of these virtual things in place before COVID-19. We're blessed as a church. We didn't have to create, but rather pivot uh, to then glorify God and still stay connected to each other. With that being said, uh, we currently have nine different things you can do during the week to stay connected with your brothers and sisters. We worship on today. We have children's devotional on Zoom at 2 p.m. On Monday evenings, we have the Women's uh, Motivational Hour. I believe Natalie Smith from Indianapolis, Indiana. Tomorrow's our speaker. On Tuesday and Thursdays at 7, we have prayer and devotional. We have some outstanding speakers for that. On Wednesday morning, we still have our morning Bible class by Bishop Rob Thickpin. I'm still doing Gray Road University on Wednesday nights. On Friday, we have the Empowerment Hour with Dr. Jeremy Flowers. On Saturday, we have Good News of the Great. And don't forget, we have a ton of cable television options as well. Uh, also, we're adding two new things this week. Number one, on Thursday afternoons at 2 p.m., uh, we're adding a uh, Season Saint Fireside Check on the conference call line for all Season Saints over 60 years old. Uh, Sister Lamenta Atwater, the coordinator for that ministry, is going to operate that. It's a time to talk, a time to catch up, at a time when we seem to be ever so isolated. Also, this Saturday at, I believe, 7 p.m., uh, we'll be having a marriage enrichment session. Uh, the, the topic this uh, Saturday will be uh, Quarantine Chronicles, how to make your marriage survive in quarantine. Some of us are saying, roll each other, say amen. And then we have a long time. 
So Brenda and George will leave that also on the Zoom platform. That's 11 different things. If you are not connected during the quarantine, it is no one's fault but yours. So therefore, we encourage you uh, to get involved, get active. The Grey Road Church is never idle, even when it's online. We're never idle, the things still yet to be done. We can't wait to connect with you this week. And here's something different. Don't just bring yourself, give somebody else this information. Your friends are invited, your family is invited. So please come out to all the calls and all the Zooms. We would love to meet your friends and family too. In closing, uh, on next week, it is Easter Sunday. We know that, quote unquote. And we know that we're not gonna be in this building for Easter. So feel free to wear all your fluorescent colors at home. But uh, as you would do on Easter, you would invite your family and friends to see us in virtual worship. We encourage you to do that as well. Even though you're not in the physical pews, you are in the virtual pews, we would encourage you to invite you to come next Sunday. We will still be talking about temptation, but we'll address Jesus in the wilderness. In closing, uh, we will uh, be distributing communion. Uh, we know that it's the month of April. We gave you communion for March. Since we have four more weeks, you probably need more communion. Uh, we will be distributing four weeks supply of communion. Uh, we'll be in the building Friday from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. and Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Again, Friday from 2 to 6, Saturday from 10 to 2. You can come and get your four week supply of communion. If you are a seasoned saint or otherwise unable to come, uh, contact with Venture at Water or your bridge gapper and they will make sure that you are taken care of. We love you, we miss you, but we're so glad to have this connection. Let's praise God for the time we have right now. This time we'll have a closing hymn and then we will be dismissed. When peace like a river attendeth my way Love life.